metabolites, they will also be hydrolyzing the food matrix and producing other organoleptic properties, right? Now today we're going to talk about single cell protein. We're going to talk about fermentation, but at the end of the day, we're not looking at the metabolites, uh, we're not looking about the how, on how the uh, microorganisms that are going to hydrolyze the food and change the food properties. We're going to look at microorganisms as a whole, as a biomass. When we grow microorganisms, if we were to look under the microscope, we see a single cell, right? If that single cell begins to replicate, then we'll see more cells. And if we were to house all the cells, we will call them biomass. Now, these biomass, if we look at them as a whole, we will see in large quantities. But if we were to actually look under the microscope, they are actually single cells. Many of them are actually single cells. And many of these cells contain high amount of proteins. And we call these single cell proteins. So let's look at what are single cell proteins. Now, microbial biomass can also be consumed. Not only that we can utilize the microorganism for the production of metabolites or their ways of hydrolyzing food matrix, we can actually consume the microorganism itself. So single cell protein are actually microorganisms, and from the name single cell, we're talking about one cell, that are very high in protein contents, and they can actually be used as protein supplements. So microbial cells sometimes can contain up to 65, sometimes higher percent of proteins. And what kind of proteins we're talking about, we're going to look about that later. So proteins or protein concentrates extracted from microbial cells. Now these microbial cells, we can break them and we can hydrolyze, or hydrolyze them and we can actually obtain whatever that is inside the cell. We call intracellular cell content. Now yeast cells, nucleotides, account to about 10 to 15 percent of total nitrogen. So not all microorganism cells are single cell proteins, only certain ones. So let's look at uh, some of it. But uh, before we go on uh, to the examples of spirulina and also yeast, now let's look at some nutritional value of microbial biomass. Yes, they are called single cell proteins, but not the entire cells comprises of protein. They also have other things. When they're high in, uh, in protein content, we can, most of the time, we can actually use them as a feed because we would also want uh, the uh, tradition, especially in the traditional uh, cottage industries, they use a lot of these uh, supplements, protein supplements, because sometimes they are byproducts and they're cheaper. Now, as components of food or feed, food for us, feed for the animals, mainly contributed to the protein nutrition. Now, protein content is highest in bacteria when we talk about single cell protein, and lowest amount can be obtained from fungi. So you see, not all microorganisms can actually be used as a protein source. They have proteins, but not that high. Now, not all single cell proteins that are obtained from microorganisms can be used for human consumption. They can be used for animals, for feed. For humans, less of it, only certain selected ones. Now this is because some of the protein contents are very high in nucleic acid. And once nucleic acid are degraded or metabolized, they can turn out to produce um, other byproducts such as uric acid. And uric acid in humans, if the concentration is too high, it will get accumulated and the consequence is gout. All right? So that is why we don't actually consume too much of a single cell protein there is an article I will upload on e-learning, you can read about that, uh, the controversies of single cell protein. But for feed, it's okay. But that doesn't mean we cannot use it for, for food. We can, but we need subsequent processing. You need to remove some of the nucleic acid. We need to remove some of the toxins, for example, okay? Now, using food, one example is inactivated dry yeast. So yeast are relatively safe because we consume a lot of yeast in breads, during baking, as what we have covered in the uh, past lecture. So yeast is also very high in protein, a single cell protein. We're going to talk about yeast later. In dry yeast form, in fabricated foods such as baked goods, uh, soup, gravies, meat, later we'll look at why. Why is it desired that we can use yeast, yeast extract actually, in 
gravies and soup. It's because of the flavor profile. We will look at the flavor profile later. We can add up to 2% for desirable flavor. We'll talk about all the flavor. Activated yeast, you can use that as well. Healthy food industries as tablet or dry powder form. Uh, often fortified with water-soluble vitamins. So some of these yeasts do not have sufficient vitamins. So if you want to have it as a nutrient supplement, we have to have it in an enhanced matter. So we enhance it with other vitamins. Now later we're gonna look at spirulina. Then we have yeast autolysate. Now from the word autolysate, you can see that it means hydrolyzed. Yeast cells hydrolyzed. So once the yeast cells are hydrolyzed, we take only the intracellular content. We extract the intracellular content, right? So we call it yeast extract or yeast auto uh, autolysate. Then inside yeast, other than the protein content, we also have what we call the five ribonucleotides. Now these five ribonucleotides contribute a lot to flavors. Uh, for example, five ionosic acid, five guanylic acid, and uh, they are basically metabolized from all the nucleosides. Now later we're gonna look at what's the function of all these five ribonucleosides. And then use in feed. So for feed, normally we don't need further processing. And one of it is uh, brewer's yeast. So in the brewery industry, like uh, maybe beer fermentation, wine fermentation, some of them are filtered. So once they're filtered, some of these yeasts can be used in the feed industry. So they can be compressed back. Uh, most of the time, we don't need further processing, but if you want further processing, there are options. So we can be just uh, use it as a raw material and also feed it back to the animals. So one example is uh, Candida Utilis, but we also have Saccharomyces cerevisiae. Active dry yeast or compressed yeast are sometimes used to inoculate, add it into cereals, ferment them, and then add the cereals and the fermented yeast, yeast product to the animal. So that can be used as feed. Uh, short proteins for feeding monogastric animals, ah, even in pet industries. So some of these pet foods are also very high in proteins. Most of them are actually very high in proteins. But some of these proteins actually come from all these brewery byproducts. Now we will take spirulina as an example. Of course, later we're gonna look at yeast. So for single cell protein, spirulina is also a very good source because it also has a very high content of protein. But in addition to protein, spirulina will also have its uh, other benefits. We will look at that. Now spirulina is a planktonic, photosynthetic uh, bacteria. We can have a lot of this in uh, mass production, in still waters, in ponds, but that, uh, that is relatively hard to control. If you have it in an open pond, then you will depend on the open condition, rain, uh, alteration of pH because of that, and things like that. How about contamination from other microorganisms? So now, many people are actually breeding spirulina in their own ponds, man-made ponds, a little bit more controlled, but contamination still happens, and sometimes contamination can go up to two to four percent, sometimes even more, but at least more control. Now why is it that people are actually cultivating spirulina? So it's a very good source of single cell protein, and uh, it has its nutraceutical properties, bioactive properties, other than proteins. Now let's look at its high nutritional value. It is very high in essential nutrients, such as provitamins, minerals, and proteins. Now, provitamins, uh, I just want to explain a little bit on provitamins. Do not get confused between provitamins and vitamins. Provitamins are actually the precursor for vitamins. So if we were to consume provitamins, it will get metabolized inside our body. Now once it is metabolized, it will be converted to its bioactive form, the vitamins. So one example of provitamins is beta-carotene. So beta-carotene is not vitamin A. Beta-carotene and vitamin A are two different things. So if we were to consume beta-carotene, our body will metabolize it and convert that to vitamin A for our absorption, okay? So that's provitamins. So spirulina actually have a high content of provitamins. It also has a lot, a high content of polyunsaturated fatty acids, such as the gamma linolenic acid. And it also has special pigments. We're gonna look at some of these pigments. <coughs> now, 
Because of all these contents, Spirulina has been extensively researched. There, there is huge research on Spirulina and its nutraceutical properties. Nutraceuticals means beyond basic functions. So it would have additional bioactive functions. So one of it is hypocholesterolemic, meaning reducing cholesterol levels for those high cholesterol people. Antioxidant compounds, phenolic compounds, and uh, the extraction of nutritionally active compounds in pure form is very expensive. So basically, if we were to grow spirulina, extract it, get the intracellular extract, after that purify all the bioactive or nutraceutical compounds, that would be a very expensive process. So there are also many methods where we don't do all this extraction or purification, consume the whole spirulina. And I'm very sure now if you just walk into any pharmacy, any drug stores, you can actually see them selling spirulina as a supplement, as a tablet, right? So we can, we're going to look at a video and uh, how that happens. Now this is the traditional production of spirulina, not traditional, cottage industry, traditional industry. Antenna Technologies, an NGO of scientists in Geneva, Switzerland, has 10 years' experience on Spirulina with its subsidiary in Madurai, India, and with production centers in... Spirulina suits very much maybe our condition, our climate too. Hot, alkaline. Now you notice that they said every two hours they will have to stir the tank, right? Two reasons. One because they don't want the spirulina to submerge too much at the bottom of the tank. They are photosynthetic microorganisms. Most of this tank would be made shallow, so they could actually have um, access to sunlight, and also. During fermentation, during growth, they would also produce more biomass, right? And as they produce more biomass, it will so much again. And they need alkaline. So during growth, the pH will be changed, which is why they keep adding uh, uh, what they call supplements or what they call fertilizers. Actually, they're adjusting the pH. So you don't want it to be too acidic. That will that will actually inhibit the growth of spirulina, or the growth will no longer be optimized. So they will have to decrease, uh, sorry, increase the pH again to alkaline level during fermentation, during biomass replication. So as you can see also, we don't eat it as a whole. They produce it in also in tablet forms. Uh, now they can actually compress that into tablet forms too, instead of capsules. So I'm sure you can get that from all these drugstores, okay? So that's spirulina. Now, let's look at how much spirulina that we are looking at. Now, dry weight, we are looking at dry weight basis. It can go up to more than 70%, which is a lot. So imagine the entire cell, more than 70% are proteins. Now, they have high concentration of essential amino acids. Now, what are essential amino acids? Any ideas? Sorry? Yes, we cannot synthesize that, but we need that. So we have to get that from external uh, materials, exogenous materials, food, okay? Now, it has very high concentration of amino acids, but it cannot replace many of these high protein foods, such as eggs, milk, meat, it's still lower than that. So this is important for people who are vegetarian, who are vegans, but they cannot completely replace the proteins of dairy and meat. 
But they're better than plant proteins, such as that from legumes, such as the article that you read on Nigerian legumes. I hope you have read that. Have you come across the part where proteins are hydrolyzed and it also releases peptides and amino acids and release some essential amino acids too, right? But it's different. You will have a very different profile compared to spirulina. Now, it is also rich in all the uh, GLA, ALA, uh, EPA, DHA. I'm sure you've, had, you've heard of all this. Even from our commercials, our advertisements. So many of our food products now are fortified with this. Even children's or infant's milk powder are fortified with DHA. Everything is about DHA, brain development, neurons con connections, right? So spirulina has a, is a good source of that. Then, other than all this, spirulina is also very rich in uh, vitamins. Now let's look at, I, I hope you can see the uh, relation, the association. Single cell proteins are normally very high in protein contents, but they're also very high in B vitamins, not just any vitamins, particularly B vitamins. If we look at yeast, same, or well, different profiles of course, different concentrations, but the same association, high protein, high B vitamins. Spirulina, the same thing. So let's look at what kind of uh, B vitamin, B1, B2, B3, B9, and so on. Now some have also claimed that they are high in B12. Uh, possible, they, it's possible, but there are also some controversies. Now the controversy is raised because the uh, method to detect B12, uh, some methods, not all methods, now they have, very, they have very good methods that can actually detect B12. Well some of the common methods to detect B12 cannot differentiate between what are we detecting. Are we detecting B12 or some similar compounds such as corinoids? So we cannot differentiate which is which. So because of that, we cannot actually substantially claim that spirulina actually contains a high amount of B12. Then we look at minerals and pigments. Of course, it is also very rich in minerals compared to its protein content lower, but minerals we don't actually need a lot. Most of these are micro minerals. We need only in small quantities. So calcium, copper, ferrum, magnesium, uh, zinc, and so on. Now, one very interesting thing about spirulina is that it contains a lot of pigment. Now, I'm sure the food students would have done your uh, food chemistry where you do thin layer chromatography, you separate colors. Do you do that? Uh, Bioprocess students, maybe you don't have the experiment to do that. But basically what we do is that you take a dot of color. The color may look green. Run it through thin layer chromatography. You will learn about all this chromatography in uh, year three and year four. I think Dr. Sophia would have taught you that chromatography, right? I don't know if she has taught you thin layer chromatography. So run it through a thin layer of uh, paper, right? and uh, you will see the green color being separated into different tones. Because actually, it is not green. Not just green, it will have other colors as well. So for spirulina, when we look at spirulina, it looks green. But inside, there are actually many pigments. So if we separate that through thin layer chromatography, we will be able to see all these pigments. Now some of these pigments, of course, we have chlorophyll A, which is green. We also have xanthophyll, which is yellow. Then we have beta-carotene, which is red-orange. Now beta-carotene is a precursor for vitamin A, which is why you could actually get pro-vitamins or precursor for certain vitamins in spirulina. And then we have ZZNP, which is orange. So there are actually different pigments that we can obtain from spirulina. Then we also have algae. Now, algae biomass is highly used. Uh, well, this is a food bioprocess course, so we will just cover uh, food. I hope bioprocess students still remember when I covered this in the first year of algae. We can use algae to produce electric. I hope you still remember that. We can use algae to produce biofuel. I hope you can still remember that, but that's not food. So for food, algae, actually, if you grow algae a lot, it looks exactly like a photo where you can actually harvest a lot of biomass. Now that is a lot of cells already, okay? If you look under the microscope, you will actually see single cells too. So algae biomass may, can be a possible source of fuel and so on, pharmaceuticals. But let's look at for food purposes. They are there for food and feed because of its nutraceutical or bioactive uh, potentials. They have a high content of amino acids, high, relatively high amount of vitamins, Better carotene or the DHA, EPA again, polysaccharides, and sometimes antibiotics as well. Now let's look at what is the value of single cell proteins in terms of algae. Now, if 
we use algae and we separate that, purify that for specific compounds, for very specific objectives. For research, for example, you can see that the value is actually very high. For research, the uh, FICO or Billy proteins, we can actually look at value in dollars per kilogram, 10,000 dollars per kilogram, and look at the market value, millions of dollars. And if, but if, of course, if we use it for food coloring, then you don't need so much purification. Uh, Bioprocess students, I will be teaching on downstream processing later, I think next year, next, next step. So you will look at all the downstream processing of harvesting all this. So between research and food coloring, food coloring, we don't need so much purification. For research, we need pure compounds sometimes, very pure, not exactly 100%. 99%, 98%. So because of the purification steps, it's expensive. Now that can actually reduce the price to 100 times. Food coloring is just $100 per kilogram. Then of course we have provitamin A, uh, beta carotene, which is relatively high as well, $500 per kilogram. Then we have xanthophyll, vitamin C, vitamin E, polysaccharides. So look at single cell proteins, not entirely proteins, though as I've mentioned, dry weight can go up to maybe 70%. Proteins, but the other 30% can comprise polysaccharides, vitamins, pigments, and so on. So just because they are called single cell proteins doesn't mean they do not contain polysaccharides or carbohydrates. And another thing is algae oil. Now, if we look at the typical production of oil, uh, first, of course, we have all the oil in uh, triglycerides form. Then, of course, we go through transesterification in the presence of alcohol. We change this oil into fatty acids, esters. So we call it methyl esters or fatty acids. And of course, we produce glycerol. But algae, if you look at some of the algae cells, for this one, for example, and this one, you can see that they are actually filled with oil. So algae sometimes are also pretty rich in oil. Now, how do we control whether we want more proteins or we want more oil. It all depends on the fermentation. Remember in the earlier lecture, what substrates that we feed to the microorganism, they will produce something else. So if we change the substrate, they may accumulate more oil. Now the beauty of algae for oil production is that we can control the, the specific strains of algae to produce what specific oil you want. Do you want a long hydrocarbon chain that you can produce oil, for example, for jets. Or you want a shorter hydrocarbon chain of oil that we can produce just few for maybe normal automotive industries. So how to control the long carbon chain, hydrocarbon chain, or the short hydrocarbon chain, that will depend on what type of algae you're using and what type of substrate that we're feeding them with. So that's the beauty of fermentation. We can control that to produce whatever that we want. Then we look at yeast. Now yeast. Uh, I'm sure all of you would have seen yeast under the microscope. For microbiology, you've seen that. For bioprocess class, have you seen that yeast? Now, yeast cells are larger than bacteria cells. So yeast cells, usually we use it for, I think, the first lesson, where they get you to get used to handle the microscope. So sometimes it's very hard to see bacteria cells, too small. Yeast cells are very easily observed. You can see yeast cells relatively easy. They're bigger. And they look like an egg, oval in shape. And they replicate their budding. Uh, one example here. They bud, then this will become a new cell. Okay? Now in Malaysia, I repeat again, for whole cells consumption, only two, two types of yeast, Saccharomyces cerevisiae and Candida utilis. Now Saccharomyces cerevisiae is highly used for bread making. Now yeast, again, very high in protein content, but they are also very high in B vitamin content. So they're actually a very good source of not just single cell protein, protein content, but also for vitamins. Now, the functions related to metabolism, precursors for minerals and cofactors required for, for, for growth. Now, vitamin B have all these functions, which is why we actually need B vitamins, but not in abundant quantity. And sometimes, insufficient by vitamin B can lead to a lot of diseases, skin disease, even skin diseases. So now I'm researching on that. Now, yeast biomass is rich in most of the B vitamins group. Uh, it can be used, as I've mentioned just now, to enrich B vitamin deficient diets. So certain diets, uh, lack of B vitamins, supplement that with yeast extract. High levels of niacin, 
Now, uh, riboflavin and also thymine. They can accumulate in the yeast cells. You can consume the whole yeast, or we can hydrolyze the yeast and produce yeast extract. So we're going to look at some of it later. Now, amino acids. I hope you know what are amino acids, the building blocks of protein. So we will have two N, one uh, amine uh, N, and also the carboxyl N. So basically, uh, they would have a uh, amphiphilic property, acidic, uh, alkaline. Okay, there are 20 standards amino acid, but our body cannot synthesize all 20. We can only synthesize uh, some of it. So what happens to the others that we need but we cannot synthesize? So we have to get it from exogenous sources. So one of it will be like from yeast. And let's look at yeast profile. We can have a lot of phenylalanine, alanine, valine, leucine. All these uh, amino acids can be obtained from yeast. Now this interesting thing will be other than the proteins, other than the uh, uh, vitamin Bs, yeast is also very highly researched because of its bioactive properties, because of its functional properties. So one of it is uh, yeast beta-glucan. I don't know if you've heard of this, but you can also get beta-glucan highly available in drugstores and pharmacies as supplement. Now why is it so? Now beta-glucan have very high applications, mainly for immuno uh, stimulation of immune system, stimulation of the immune system, what we call immunomodulation. So glucan can be obtained from the cell wall of yeast. So yeast cells, in cell wall, after that, you, we can hydrolyze yeast, get whatever intracellular content from yeast, what we call intracellular content or yeast extract. Now the remaining residual, the cell wall of yeast, can also contain high amount of glucan. So what can we use? Now one example is the immunostimulant. So one of it is that it can protect female cows from mastitis uh, against the philococcal mastitis, so infection. It increases the functions so that it can fight against infection from staphylococcus. Now when this happens, most of the time this female cow cannot be used for milk production anymore. So it has to be separated. We don't want to contaminate the whole tank of milk because if we were to have milk production from that, staphylococci can also infiltrate into the milk and it can contaminate the entire batch. So most probably uh, this particular cow will have to be removed from the herd for treatment. So that actually is an economic loss. It can also promote the production of menocytes, uh, white, white blood cells, fibroblasts, collagen and elastin, and so on. And it also stimulates microphages for defense, which is why uh, glucan right now you can, it is widely available in pharmacies and drugstores, because we can actually buy that, again, in tablet form or in capsule forms for immunostimulatory purposes. Okay? Now, yeast can also be used as flavoring agents due to its amino acid content. Now, when we talked about single cell proteins, we're not talking about them having long strands of proteins. Many of these are also in the forms of peptides and also in the form of amino acids. Now, amino acids, as we know, are in the form of essential amino acids that we can use to supplement our diets if we don't have it, if we, in other diets if we don't have it. So amino acid uh, deficiency diets, and then we can also have it as um, amino acid supplements. But more importantly, for yeast extract, most of the time, the amino acid can be used as flavoring agent because different amino acids will give different flavor profiles. So some of the amino acid can have, can have a bitter taste, some not so ever. Now, let's look at some examples. Glycine. Now this is based on sensory panelists under very controlled condition. Now the condition is that we have to heat amino acid with glucose at 180 degrees Celsius. So I would suspect that Maillard reaction would have already occurred too at this, at this point. But let's look at the taste profile. Different amino acid will give different taste profile. Glycine give caramel, valley chocolate taste, uh, glutamic acid toffee, Arginine, burnt sugar, something that uh, we may or may not want. Proline actually tastes like case, cakes and pastries. Now, that is when we heat one amino acid with glucose at 100 degrees Celsius. What happens if we don't heat, we just consume the amino acid on its own, it will have a different taste. 
And if we merge two amino acid or three amino acid to form peptide, it will have a different taste again. So that's the beauty of amino acid being used as flavoring agents. So let's look at the synergistic effect, the combination effects of uh, uh, serine and uh, glutamine. It produces meaty flavors. But if you have glutamine alone, it produces GMP or umami taste. I will explain what is umami later. So because of all these interaction effects, synergistic effects, and individual amino acid effects, they can actually be used to flavor a lot of foods. So it can produce nutty uh, taste, cheesy taste, creamy flavor, and so on. So sometimes it can be used to substitute uh, other flavoring ingredients for, parmes uh, for parmesan cheese, toppings for pop uh, popcorns, and so on. Then, of course, we have the five ribonucleotides too. So other than the amino acid, yeast extracts is also a very good source of five ribonucleotides. Now, yeast extract can actually act as flavor enhancers, modifiers, contribute by its nucleotide content. So nucleotides, what, are, what kind of nucleotides are we talking about? The five ribonucleotides. We can have five eonosine monophosphate, IMP, or five guanine monophosphate, or GMP. Now these two very frequently are used as substitute for meat taste products. Have you tasted any products mainly produced for vegetarian or vegan? They are not made from meat, but they taste like meat. Yes, they are. Uh, I particularly like this oyster sauce. It's not made from oyster. It's called an oyster sauce, but it's not made from oyster. It is used by vegetarian, vegans. Vegans are very strict vegetarians. They don't even eat eggs. Okay, so very, very strict. So where do they get all this flavor from? We can get it from yeast extract because of this GMP and IMP. Go try, go test, go buy one bottle of uh, oyster sauce for vegetarian, and you'll be able to, to see the, the difference. It tastes almost similar. I, I'm, I, I'm impressed. Now let's look at umami. Now that is umami. Umami is what we call the fifth taste. When we do sensory, we only know four tastes. Uh, of course, then you have a, a spicy taste, a spicy re reaction uh, on the skin, but that is not a taste. We're talking about sensory. Okay, when we talk about taste, now let's look at our tongue. The tip of our tongue, we can taste sugar. Then after this, Go deeper inside, sourish. Then you go deeper inside, you, you taste saltish. Then at the center, at the back center, you taste bitter. All right, this is our tongue. All right, tip, sweet, here bitter. Now umami is where we will taste umami profile, the center of our tongue. Umami is what I've explained just now. It gives you this beefy, cheesy, uh, meaty taste. But you don't know how to describe it. Is it saltish? No, not exactly. It's beefy. It's meaty. So that is what we call umami. And umami comes from all these five ribonucleotides profile. Now, we can also have umami taste from uh, amino acids itself. Now, umami and sour taste, we can have it from glutamate, aspartic acid, sweet from this amino acid, bitter taste from this amino acid. I remember a few years back when I was doing my, uh, another project with yeast extract. So we were growing yeast cells for single cell protein purposes, but we were using agricultural waste. So we had to collect all these pineapple waste from, from all these pineapple industries. When we produce pineapple in the caning industry, we chop off right the skin, the crown, the base, they throw it. They just want the inner part, and then they will chop it down further and can it. So in the can pineapple canning industry, I, I'm sure all of you would have eaten pineapple cocktail, right? So the skin, the crown, the base, all that were thrown, we collected it, and uh, we extracted it, because it, it is still very high in sugar content, sugar and minerals. So we extracted it out, and we used that to grow pineapples, uh, sorry, to grow yeast. So we are actually using an industrial byproduct to produce something beneficial, which is the single cell protein. We managed to grow that, no problem. But when we did the sensory profile, some of them actually have very high content of all these amino acids. And it turns out that our yeast extract was bitter. <laughs> so it wasn't good. 
But of course, we also managed to find some yeast extract that are pleasant in taste. But we always have a control. The control would be yeast extract available commercially that have been optimized, and we cannot obtain that taste. Now, these are what we call commercial yeast extract, vetch, mite, bovril. Uh, as I've mentioned just now, the uh, oyster sauce used for vegetarian or vegan. Go try buy one, one bottle of this uh, bovril vetch mite. It's expensive because the whole processing is expensive. But try buy a small bottle and maybe you can share among yourselves and you can see the difference. They taste umami. You have a meaty, uh, beefy taste, but actually it's yeast extract. Okay? So what happens is this. Uh, grow the yeast, break the yeast cells. Now breaking yeast cells can be obtained via several ways. You can have physical breakage of the cell. I will touch on that in uh, downstream processing next semester. Or you can give it a temperature shock. So when cells we heat it up uh, at a certain temperature, they will lyse, and whatever intracellular content will be leached out. So that is what we call yeast extract. Another thing is that most of the time we don't want to use all these. We can also use uh, the addition of salt. So because of osmosis pressure, cells can also lyse. So when they lyse, um, during processing of yeast extract, actually, we also add salt. So if we use this process to actually hydrolyze or go for cell lysis, then we, we have to add less salt. So because of that, we managed to obtain yeast extract at a relatively low cost. Relatively low cost, it's still expensive. Now after that, of course, the QAQC will still have to go through the entire process of checking. Now if we go through heat treatment, will that denature some of the protein? If so, how is the amino acid or peptide profile? So all these kind of uh, processing are not cheap. We have to go through all that. Now bovril or vegemite, other than the protein content, they are still very high in vitamin B. And vitamin B, in many instances, they are also very heat sensitive. So the pro production of yeast extract is not as simple as what we think. Take a yeast cell, lyse the yeast cell, and we get yeast extract. Yes, we lyse the yeast cells, but how do we lyse them? Now then they will have further concentration because upon lysis, uh, you will obtain a very thick yeast slurry. But if you have consumed uh, those commercial yeast extracts, some in powdered form, some in thick paste like marmite, Batch my above rail, you can see that it's very, very thick, very, very concentrated. So again, you have to go through a concentration process, and again, another additional cost. So which is why the entire process is not cheap. So during concentration, the bagatanya, temperature control, to maintain the active properties of the vitamins and other heat sensitive compounds. Okay, now are all yeast the same? Uh, I want you to read this on your own. This is very simple. I want to go to the Q&A discussion already. Now, are all yeast the same? Well, basically, yeast comes from two, two main types, although there, there are other types that we can consume uh, if we do not consume as a whole cell. But basically, when we consume as a whole cell, for us here, Saccharomyces cerevisiae can be that utilized. But like I've mentioned just now, even Saccharomyces cerevisiae, there are many, many different strains of Saccharomyces cerevisiae. Now all these strains will have different attributes, different strengths. Some of them, if you read this, uh, you read down your, your slides later, we can actually use that for baker's yeast, for brewer's yeast. Brewer's yeast is because we want to use that in the brewery industry, right? To produce alcoholic beverages. So what kind of traits do we need from those yeasts? One good trait is that they must be tolerant against alcohol, ethanol tolerance. Baker's yeast, do we need specific strains that are tolerant to ethanol? No, we don't need that specific trait. We, what do we need for baker's yeast, for baking bread purposes? We need those strains to produce a lot of carbon dioxide and preferably produce a lot of carbon dioxide very quickly. For brewing, uh, pr producing alcoholic beverages, do we need such a trait to produce a lot of carbon dioxide? We don't. So it is because of these different traits, different yeasts will have different purposes. They are still the same yeast. Just like us, we are all humans, but we have different capabilities. They are all saccharomyces cerevisiae. Different strengths, different capabilities. 
Okay? So read on this on your own. And if you have questions, then we will discuss. Okay? So we're going to enter to our Q&A right now. I think we did not do much Q&A for the uh, previous, previous um, lecture. Maybe we can merge that and this one. Okay? You know, it's not